Training is very key for this ride. I know that's an obvious statement, but everybody needs to train in order to complete 100 miles. So this video is dedicated to training. Now, training is not a one size fits all. I'm sorry to say that at the end of this video, you're not gonna have a training plan that you can go follow and cross off every single day. And I wanna set this video up like that because it's not one size fits all. And why is it not one size fits all? Well, everybody has a different amount of time that they can put towards training, has a different fitness level that they have, has have different tools to, to track what you do out on the bike. And with different tools comes different training programs. So instead, I wanna give you more, some training principles, guidelines, rules of thumb. I wanna empower you with some knowledge in order to you know, feel comfortable building your own training plan or at least having a start of how to train for 100 miles. And I really also wanna rely on ride captains, the people that you're gonna be riding with or your ride teams to help you with your training because they can give you more personalized information and they can work with your schedule and with your ability and where you're at and what equipment you have. So I also wanna leave some, uh, some room for that as well. So we're gonna get into some training principles and I'm gonna give you some outlines of what training can look like, what training looks like for me and how that can fit kind of into your schedule. So training principles, pain is weakness, leaving the body is something I heard growing up in sports. I wrestled, I heard it a lot. Take that and throw it. Absolutely do not use that for cycling. Please do not use that for cycling. It's such a terrible approach to cycling. And I see it happen to a lot of people, myself included, when I first started cycling, I went out there and tried to pound it every single workout because that's what I did in wrestling. I played baseball as well. And you know, I tried to go really hard every practice, every game, right? Like you're trying to give it all. Do not do that for cycling. That's a terrible approach. You're gonna burn yourself out. You're probably gonna cause injury, sickness, or whatever. Plus, what a lot of people do is every single ride, they try to go like 85% of what their 100% is every single ride, and they just plateau. Like, they never get better. They never go super hard, and they never go super easy. So one thing that I've learned in cycling is going really slow can help you go really fast. I'll get more into that. But pain is weakness, leaving the body. Throw that out the window. You're gonna have rides where it was super easy, and that is the purpose of that ride. Be okay with those super easy rides, because I promise they will help make you faster. We'll get into that. I want you to look at training in a long-term view. Don't look at it in a short-term view. Look at it in months, weeks, then we kind of look at it in days. But again, it's this big picture that we're building towards. Be flexible with yourself. Don't be so rigid that every single day I have to do X, Y, and Z, and if I don't do that, well, that throws everything off. No, so we wanna look at it big picture. So months, weeks, days. So I look at what my goal is for the month. Then I build the weeks in there. How much am I gonna be training each week to make this goal happen for the month? And then once I figure out kind of the weeks are gonna look like, now we can start filling in the days. And we look at each day and we say, okay, how does this day build into the bigger week and build into the bigger month? And then also it, it, it allows you to have flexibility. Because if you have, say you want to accomplish eight hours of training in one week and you're gonna do ride six times that week, right? And you do one hour every day of the week and then you're gonna do a three hour ride on Saturday. Well, on Tuesday comes up, you have family obligations and you miss one hour and you can't make it up on that Tuesday. Well, maybe you could do two hours on Wednesday or do two hours on Thursday and you could make up that hour or you could just not do that hour. So instead you did seven hours this week instead of eight hours. In the grand scheme of things, one hour is not gonna make any difference. When it does start to make a difference is if you start missing two hours week one, and then you miss three hours week two, and you miss three hours, you know, week three, and then week four, maybe you make all your hours, you miss an hour. Well, now we've missed almost a week of hours. So that is a bigger deal when you start missing consecutive weeks, but missing one day here or there is not gonna make any difference. So give yourself some grace. And that's why we look at that big picture as well. Don't look at it as just like one day, and if I miss this day, it's gonna throw off the whole training plan. Don't do that. Long-term approach, long-term approach. You wanna have a plan, okay? I make this analogy a lot with cycling. Probably a lot of you out there have lifted in the gym. Basically, when you go into the gym, does anybody just go in and say, ah, I'm gonna do bench today, maybe I'll do some legs, maybe I'll do some bicep curls? No, most of us always have a plan to go into the gym because that's common. But then a lot of us get on the bike and we go, I don't know what I should go do today, and we just go ride, right? Like, have a plan. And again, we looked at that long-term view, right? You're making a long-term plan. But have a plan. Every ride should have a plan. It should have a purpose on what you're gonna do. Even if that plan is, I have no plan today, I am just free riding, right? Like, there's a plan, there's purpose behind that. So have purpose behind your rides, have a plan. We're gonna get into training plans and there's plans out there, but have a plan in general. Like, what are you trying to accomplish? I do this with like every aspect of my cycling. My nutrition has a plan. My nutrition has a plan for this ride. This ride has a specific purpose for this goal that I want to accomplish. And I'm doing these things this week to accomplish that goal at the end of this week. And this, this week is trying to meet a goal for this 
this month and this month is trying to meet a goal for two months down the road where I have this big event, something like that. Like everything leads into it. I have this equipment for this purpose for this event, right? Like have a plan for everything and it all fits together. Now it takes time to learn all those different puzzle pieces of a plan, but at the very basis, every ride should have a plan, have a purpose behind it. So there are options for training plans out there. There's a lot of them that you can go to. So I'm gonna give some examples, but there's definitely more out there. So the couple that I would recommend, Trainer Road is a training platform that you can use for indoor cycling and outdoor cycling. Their big purpose is indoor cycling, but all of those workouts, you can move outdoors. If you have the right equipment on your bike, you can do all of those workouts. So Trainer Road, if you have a power meter, you have a smart computer and you have an indoor trainer, Trainer Road is a phenomenal place to start. It'll just build you a training plan. You just follow it. It's amazing. It's like having a coach. It's like $20 a month, something like that. Great option. Zwift is an indoor cycling platform. It has training uh, plans on their platform, but you can also just free ride, do events. You can do races, stuff like that. So if you have an indoor trainer, Zwift is a great place as well to look for training plans. MyWoosh is a free version, kind of like Zwift. Very similar, I would say, but it's free. So that's another place to look if you do indoor cycling. I will touch on indoor cycling at the end of this video because I, I love indoor cycling. So I will get into that. And then lastly, if you're looking for like just a, a basic plan, trainingpeaks.com will have plans. You'll have to purchase them. They have a wide variety. You can look through them. You don't always get access to see like what the training plan is uh, before you buy it, but there's a lot out there as well. So there is some places where you can just go buy some, some plans. Recommended first would be Trainer Road first because it's very individualized. Swift and MyWoosh, uh, not as individualized, but very good plans. And then Trainer Road, I would say you can build massively personalized training plans on Training Peaks, but it's uh, more cookie cutter plans if you're just going to buy them, which are great. Don't get me wrong. They're great, but they're not going to be as individualized to you. So when we go into training, we need to have equipment or we need to have something to measure it with. I'm big on measuring because I'm big on doing interval training. I think that is one of the best approaches you can take when you are going to train for an event, just like you were in the gym, right? You're gonna do your reps, you're gonna do your sets, and then you're gonna take a break and recover. We're gonna do the same thing out on the bike. We're gonna hit our set and then we're gonna recover. So how are we going to measure those? Well, the first and free one is RPE, rate of perceived exertion. And now this is a scale from one to 10. This is something that is gonna take time to learn if you're new to the sport and you don't know your body that well, but one to 10, 10 is like, I'm all out sprinting for my life. There's a cheetah behind me and I have to out sprint this cheetah. That is a 10. So like 10 is max. Now also 10 though can vary depending on how long the distance is. This is kind of a weird thing of cycling is I know how fast I can go if I'm out sprinting a cheetah, right? Like that's all out. But also I know how fast I can go for an hour and how to hold that 10 for an hour. So I'm clearly not going as fast as I was for the cheetah, but I'm still pushing my limits for an hour. So you also have to look at it from that standpoint of how long of time is going to pass while I'm putting out that effort. So one to 10. So one is the easiest, five is in the middle, 10 is the hardest. Rate of perceived exertion, that's one way to measure. Second way to measure, a little bit of money, but still pretty cost effective is heart rate. Heart rate is a great thing to measure if you're in cycling. The one caveat that you need to know with heart rate though is it usually lags a little bit. So if you're trying to sit within a certain heart rate zone, what a lot of people tend to do is they spike too high at the beginning of that effort because they're trying to get that heart rate up and then they try to plateau it out. So what I would recommend if you are using heart rate, slowly get up to that heart rate number. Don't spike to get to that heart rate number because you're gonna go over it. It lags a little bit. So if you're gonna do a 10 minute effort, you know, maybe take a minute to let your heart rate get up. Don't feel like you have to spike that heart rate, but then also you have to let your heart rate get back down. So again, it lags. It's a great measure though of training. So don't feel like heart rate is bad by any means. I use heart rate every single time I go out on the bike and it's definitely a training metric that I look at. Lastly is power. You can have a power meter on your bike and that is going to measure the watts that you are putting out on your bike. Power is the best measure for training because no matter if you're riding uphill, downhill, into a 20 mile headwind, into a 20 mile tailwind, you're putting out 200 watts. 200 watts is the same for every single one of those scenarios. It doesn't matter how fast you're going, how slow you're going, it does not matter, but you can use power to measure your training. Power meters cost a bit of money, they take some knowledge. I use a power meter all the time to build my training plans, but they are not necessary, but they are a very nice thing to have if you would like to invest some money in it. There's some really good options out there and it can really take your training to a different level and you can hit intervals like never before because it's so precise. So what I don't want you to use to measure your training. I don't want you to use miles per hour. 
and I don't want you to use overall miles ridden. If anything, we're gonna use total hours on the bike. So why do we not wanna use miles per hour or miles ridden? Well, first off, miles per hour has so many variables in it. And I really don't like people to measure success and how fast they are and how good they are by miles per hour. Like do not let your head unit dictate what kind of training you should do because you're like, oh, I wanna hit 18 miles per hour average. So I better go a little bit harder so I can get that. There's just so many variables with that. And I think it can really throw off your training and it's a big ego boost to a lot of people. Take that out, throw it away. Miles per hour, is, it just varies so much because it depends on how much are you going uphill that day? How much of the wind is hitting you? How much of the wind was at your at your back? Uh, was it perfect conditions that day? Was it not perfect conditions that day? Like miles per hour is so variable. Please don't use it as a measure of success or a measure of how hard your ride was or anything like that. Like again, we are completing a 100 mile ride. I get that, but in your training, don't think like you have to hit this many miles on this many days and all that stuff. I think that's bad. So don't think that you have to hit you know, miles per hour to a certain number each day. Also miles per hour, I think a lot of people look at what you do in a group and be like, oh, I gotta do that solo. No, me solo, you know, 20 miles per hour is a hard ride. 21 miles per hour, that's a hard ride. Like very hard ride solo, right? Because you have stoplights, you have stop signs, you have cars that you gotta avoid. You have all these different scenarios that, that affect your average speed. But then I go race and I can do 25 miles per hour because I'm sitting in a group and it's way easier than doing 20 miles per hour on my own. So like I, I want you to understand when you look at these groups who are doing 16 to 18 miles per hour, 18 to 20 or 14 to 16, you're gonna be much faster in a group. So don't feel like as a solo person, you need to hit those miles per hour numbers. So just put that out there. And then miles ridden in a week. I don't want you to look at miles ridden in a week either because it can vary so much depending on, again, how much elevation are you doing in your rides? The more climbing you're doing, the less miles you're gonna do. And is it windy that day? You're probably gonna do less miles if it's super windy and you got a lot of headwind. Or if you got a big tailwind, then you're gonna do more miles. Like again, there's so many variables and factors within how many miles you get in in a day. So I like to look at hours actually riding. I think it's a better measure overall for your training. So now we get into like what a day can look like, what days can look like, what weeks can look like, what months can look like. So I want you to think of everything as in a three-step build, one-step recover. I build all of my weeks like this. So if I'm looking at a four-week time period, I'm gonna have one week here, second week here, third week here, and then we're gonna rest. So this is for me, this is for me. I wanna lay out, this is for me. In the middle of my season or kind of early part of my season, I may do week one, eight hours of training, week two, 10 hours of training, and then week three, really try to put in a lot of training and do 12 hours of training. And then week four is my rest week, and that is going to be, you know, five hours of training, something like that. Like I'm gonna drop off, they're gonna be super easy rides. And if I'm doing that in the month view, then in my week view, I'm gonna do two hard rides, you know, a medium ride, probably two easy rides, and then a rest day in there, right? So everything has hard, then you have somewhat intermediate, and you have easy. In a week, I wanna suggest doing no more than two hard rides a week. Now, if you have a power meter, you can figure out a little bit more what your hard rides are. If you have RPE, you don't wanna do more than two rides that are you know, an eight to a 10 or a seven to an eight, somewhere in that range, because you don't wanna burn out. And I've seen a lot of people burn out by trying to do too many hard rides in a week. Also, you need to let your body recover. We do you know, that recovery week on week four, but in the middle of the week, you need to be recovering as well. So if you're gonna do a hard ride, maybe you do an easy ride after that, or you do an off day. Recovery can be totally off the bike as well, but you can have an easy ride in there. So I'd recommend two hard rides a week, two medium rides a week, and two easy rides a week. Now that's six days of riding. For a lot of you, that's probably going to be a lot of days and you don't need to do six days. But that's an example of two, two, two. So if you're gonna ride three days a week, maybe do one hard ride, one medium ride, one easy ride. If anything, do more easy to medium rides than doing too many hard rides. Please trust me on that. You will thank me because going slow can make you go fast because you let your body recover. And time on the bike is still time training. Easy rides will build base. They just build how to ride a bike. Easy rides can build base. I do a lot of easy miles just to continue to build time on the bike, hours on the bike, and that time accumulated will make you a better cyclist. So if you're gonna do five days of riding a week, I would do two hard days, a medium day, and two easy days. If you're gonna do four days, I'd do one hard day, one medium, two easy, something like that. So there's an example of kind of what, what you should structure your weeks like. And then again, we want to do a buildup of weeks, then take a rest. So first week, five hours, second week, six hours, third week, seven hours, rest week, 
four hours. We look at it all in number of hours per week. Now a hard ride I would also include your Saturday rides that you're gonna do with your ride captains or your teams. I would consider all of those group rides to be a medium to a hard, depending on what your group is doing. I don't know. Most likely they're not gonna be super easy because you're gonna go longer distances which will accumulate fatigue in your leg. So look at those rides as either a medium or a hard ride depending on what your group is doing. So what does a hard day look like? What does a medium and an easy day look like? So again, this is just general rules of thumbs. I'm going to say a hard day if you're going on RPE is somewhere between an hour to two hours and it's going to be probably two efforts an hour of 10 minutes at eight, seven to eight RPE, I would say something like that. And what I'm trying to get at is something called threshold. Threshold is the amount that you can hold for one hour all out. And when we're using power, that is called your functional threshold power or your FTP. But if we're using that in rate of perceived exertion, I would say on a scale of one to 10, you're going to be seven to eight. You're going to do two efforts per hour, 10 minutes in that seven to eight feeling for 10 minutes. Okay. Now, if you're using heart rate, I would get into that threshold zone and I would do, you know, 10 minutes or so of those efforts. Now you can make those efforts a little bit longer. You can make them a little bit shorter. You can flex them all the way up to about 20 minutes. Maybe would be the most I would hold in that threshold zone. And then after that, we want to recover because if you're going to go lift chest, you're going to sit down and recover after that. So that's what a hard day looks like. Probably two efforts in that threshold range per hour. And those efforts are about 10 minutes long. I would flex them all the way up to 20 at the longest of those efforts. And then we would take a rest. So it's going to be super easy after that. So it's kind of hard, easy, hard, easy. And I'm not going to train any more over threshold for most people, I would say. Now it can be very individualized, like I said, but for this ride, threshold training is probably the best that you can do in terms of hard efforts. VO2 max is more like hard sprinting efforts. It's not full sprints, but it's kind of like three minutes really hard. That's VO2 max. I do a lot of those for the style of racing I do, but for longer endurance style stuff, threshold training is, is a better approach for those hard days. Now, medium days, we're gonna sit in that what's called sweet spot. If Again, if you're training with power, you're gonna sit in those sweet spot days. So for RPE, I'm gonna say that's on the five to six. We're gonna do a little bit longer of training minutes wise compared to what we're doing threshold. So I would say about 15 minute efforts we're gonna do. We're gonna do one to two of those per hour. Again, in that RPE five to six, if you're using heart rate, again, you're gonna be in that sweet spot training. If you're using power, it's gonna be sweet spot zone two, zone three, something like that. You can look all this stuff up online. Uh, there's a lot of good articles out there for both heart rate and power and what your zones are, things of that nature. But I would say one to two efforts per hour 15 minutes, I would say again, no more than 20 to 25 when you're in that sweet spot range. Um, RPE four to six, five to six, somewhere in that range. Like they're not super hard, but they're not super easy as well. One to two of those an hour. And then again, we're going to take it easy. And then easy days are just easy. Like just pedal, like maybe a little bit of effort here and there, but you're just going to pedal. Like just take it easy. They're called easy days for a reason. So that's your hard, your medium, and your easy days. Again, this is just a, like a wide range, giving you some principles of what training can look like. I'd be happy to help you figure out what training could be applied to your life, your lifestyle, your goals. That's what I like to look at when I build training for people. I am not a certified cycling coach by any means. I am not putting that out there. But if you'd like some help on building a training plan, I would be more than happy to help you uh, figure that out. We can figure out together what makes most sense for you based on what kind of equipment do you have? What are your goals? And what kind of time do you have in the day? I'm really big on goals. Again, for this ride, it's hundred miles, but for other people, I go back to what is your goal? And then we're going to train for that goal. Again, we're going to anchor in that goal. So for this, it's all about that hundred miles. That's your goal. Okay. And that's what we're training towards. If you want to throw in other things, that is great, but we're training for that goal. And all of this training that we're doing, we are looking at that hundred miles, right? As our end goal. So we're going to do all this training probably up until about the week before the ride. And I just want to touch a little bit on trying to come in really fresh for that ride. Now, what we don't want to do is go super, super hard the week before, right? Two weeks before you can still go super hard. Your body will have plenty of time to recover. But like the weekend before, we still want to get out for a really good ride, put some, you know, fatigue into our legs. That's still very good, but we don't want to kill ourselves. If you're going to kill yourself, do it two weeks before. But the week leading up to the ride, we also don't want to do nothing, okay? We don't want to just let the legs sit, okay? We want to do some primers, basically. We want to keep the legs engaged and moving 
moving and our body moving. So we want to do a couple easy rides those days. I would even recommend doing a ride on the Friday before the big 100 mile ride, but this is something to test out and how your body responds to it. Some people don't respond well to not biking and then biking the next day. So think about this in your training. When you take an off day, how do you feel the very next day? What I recommend people do is do an easy ride the day before so that their legs are just still moving and engaged and then ride your big event, right? So just a little bit of thought around how do you actually like prep for the event, but build your training all the way up to that weekend before, and then we're gonna do easy rides the week of that. Kill yourself again, two weeks before the ride, I would say that maybe should be your biggest ride, your hardest ride, if you're training only for this event. So that's when you wanna go smash your, you know, 60, 80 mile ride, whatever your team is doing uh, to prep for the 100 mile ride. I've touched on this in a different video, but on the bike nutrition, please train with nutrition. I think it can take your training to big levels and it can really help fuel your ride. So please bring nutrition on your rides. Again, if it's a hard ride, I'm looking at 60, 70, 80 grams of carbs per hour. If it's a medium ride, you're looking at maybe 40 to 60 grams of carbs per hour. Easy ride, I still have carbs and electrolytes. I'm more at like the 30 grams of carbs per hour i am always fueling and i think nutrition really helps with recovery as well the more you're fueled on the ride the better recovered you are going to be after your ride as well and again i want to cycle that into recovery is a huge part of cycling as well please take time to recover that means sleeping that means eating right off the bike that means you know massage guns foam rolling stretching do things to recover off of the bike i don't want to go super deep on it but like find out ways for yourself so that you can recover really well off the bike train hard recover harder, find ways to recover well. Like don't go do a big weightlifting session and then go play a ton of basketball and then think that you're gonna do really well on the bike because you are tired from those events. You can't go ride on the bike super hard. So like think about how you're mixing those things into your life or if you have a deck project, you probably don't wanna bike hard that day. Or if you biked really hard, then you're gonna do a deck project in the afternoon, something like that. Like that's gonna take a toll on your body. You're not gonna recover as well that day. So then the next day, right? Like you may need to recover more on the next day. Just trying to throw out some examples there. Some of the last things I wanna to touch on is I'm a dad, uh, I work a full-time job. When it's time to train, it's time to train. This is something that I really had to learn becoming a dad that I didn't have to do when I was single and when I didn't have kids, things like that. So when I didn't have kids, right, if I was like, ah, I'm gonna go train at two o'clock, that's when I think I'm gonna go. But I was on my phone a little bit longer and I was talking to my wife a little bit longer and I didn't get out till three, who really cares? And then I went till four or five, six, didn't matter, right? <laughs> now that I have kids, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna ride at two o'clock. Two o'clock comes, I better be ready to ride. So like I get my nutrition ready before that usually, like I get things in place so that I can be ready at two o'clock to ride. And then it hits and I get out the door and I ride or I get in the door because most of the time I'm riding indoors. But I'm ready to ride, right? Like I have things prepped for it. So I would, definitely give that piece of advice to a lot of people when it's time to train, train, right? Like don't lollygag, get to it, get your work done, and then you can get on with the rest of your life. Little tidbit there. Group rides are a great way to learn training. Again, I think most people in this ride are gonna be riding with a, a ride leader or they're gonna have a team that they're training with. Like use those group rides to learn to bike better. Use people in there who are better cyclists than you and learn from them and glean information and ask a lot of questions. But outside of the Fathers for Fatherless, there's a lot of great group rides going on throughout the Twin Cities. Bike shops have them, all that. Go join these uh, group rides to learn how to ride in a pack better, to learn how to be a better cyclist. It's a great time to learn a lot of information. Lastly, this is, you can skip over this if you don't wanna do indoor training, but I train a ton indoors, okay? Most of the year I'm indoors because it's winter, but also like during the week, I train a ton indoors. Why do I train indoors? Because I think it is one of the most efficient ways to train compared to, to outdoors. Like it's just, it's so efficient. Why is it efficient? There's no stoplights, there's no traffic, there is no sidewalks, there's no uh, debris on the road, there's no wind, there's, there's no flat tires, right? Like there's nothing that can get in the way of my workout. And I'm never gonna stop pedaling indoors. That's another huge thing. Like I never stop pedaling indoors, uh, which I just think makes for a more efficient ride. So all of my intervals that I'm trying to hit, there's nothing that is going to interrupt that interval when I am inside, except for a kid coming to knock on the door, which happens every once in a while when I'm training indoors. But who cares? I can talk to my kid and get my workout in at the same time. It's beautiful, it's amazing. So I love indoor training. 
Some people hate it because you're indoors. I get that, whatever. Indoor training is such a great option. Now, if you're gonna get into indoor training, get a smart trainer. There is direct drive and there is wheel on trainers. Wheel on trainers mean that you have your back wheel on the trainer. If you have this, by no means am I saying that they're bad, but they're not as good as direct drive, I would say. You can manipulate power with the wheel on trainers. So if you're gonna invest your money, I know it is more money. It's probably starting at $500 into $1,000. Go direct drive. That is where you have no back wheel and your bike connects to the cassette on the trainer. They are just, they're a better trainer. If you're gonna invest the money, I would go with direct drive trainers. And then you can use platforms like Zwift, MyWoosh, uh, Wahoo System X. There's a lot of options out there. Trainer Road that I touched on in the beginning. There's a lot of options for training options indoors. But I think indoors is just the most efficient way of getting your training in. If you are new to indoor training though, Please get yourself some fans, or if you indoor train right now and you're like, oh my gosh, I just sweat all over the place, get yourself some indoor fans. You will you will train much better because the, the more you can cool down your body, the more effort you can put out. Get some indoor fans if you're not already using indoor fans. You're just gonna make your ride that much better. You're gonna sweat less as well. You can put out more effort with those fans. So that's my advice to you there. Now also, I like to watch things on the TV. Uh, as well for entertainment, so I'm not just super bored. So again, get yourself some entertainment if you're gonna do indoor training. But I think indoor training is probably the best thing to do. And also you can train at five in the morning, you can train at eight at night. Uh, there's no cars, it's safer. I just think it's a, it's a really good way to train for cycling. I think it's a great option to get into indoor cycling. I think it'd be really beneficial for a lot of us who are, who are busy, we're dads. We uh, don't have a ton of time to go outside. It takes time to go outside and ride your bike. You can get a really good workout in, much quicker time period indoors, and you have less factors of cars and safety and things like that. And also your kids can come join you for your workout. So that is what I have on training. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that this helps to give you an idea of what training can look like. I know it was vague at times. I just don't wanna get too prescriptive or too like zoned in on you have to do this because each person is different, right? Like we have different, we just have different bodies and different things work for different people. And so like go try to learn as much information as you can on training if you really wanna like get better at cycling and go see what works for you. Like that one thing that works for this person doesn't work for this person. It's so true in training. And I've had to figure out kind of what works best for me and and you know manipulate that to, to work best with my schedule and my budget and how much time I can put in. So again, you gotta kind of figure all that out for yourself. And I know that can be daunting, but at least I tried to give you some guidelines and some guardrails on what to do if you're just starting out. Or even if you have trained for a little while, I hope you got some information out of this as well. I hope you kill it on race day because you were so well-trained for everything that you learned in this video. Thank you so much for watching.